Uh, good morning and welcome to the 26th meeting of 2015. Uh, everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones and other electronic equipment as they affect the broadcasting system. Some committee members uh, may consult tablets during the meeting. This is because we provide meeting papers in digital format. Uh, we have apologies today from Cara Hilton. Um, agenda item one uh, is to take evidence as part of our inquiry into arm's length external organisations. And I welcome Ian Murray, Chief Executive of High Life Highland, uh, and Bill Alexander, Director of Care and Learning at Highland Council, uh, giving evidence on High Life Highland, which provides uh, cultural, sporting, leisure, learning and health initiatives and projects on behalf of Highland Council. Uh, Erica Dear, Operations and Finance Director of the EDI Group, and Peter uh, Watton, uh, Head of Corporate Property, City of Edinburgh Council, giving evidence on EDI Group, a property development and investment business set up by the City of Edinburgh Council. Julian Ferry, Chief Executive uh, of Culture at North Lanarkshire, and Lisanne McMurrach, Head of Education, Skills and Lifelong Learning. Uh, at North Lanarkshire Council, giving evidence on Culture NL, North Lanarkshire Council's Cultural Services, Alio. And Sandra Ross, Managing Director of Bon Accord Care, which delivers a range of social care services for Aberdeen City Council. Uh, before we begin hearing from witnesses, uh, I would like to comment on the absence of witnesses from Aberdeen City Council this morning. Last week, the Chief Executive wrote to me indicating they were not currently in a position to attend this inquiry, uh, as officers with responsibilities relating to Alios have been asked to focus on other activity and they did not think they could give appropriate and useful input to an appearance at the committee. Uh, the clerk to our committee has had a series of conversations with Aberdeen City Council in this regard, re reminding them of our powers to compel witnesses and urging them to reconsider. He has also reminded them of what I said on behalf of the committee in December last year in response to similar issues and we were then, that we were then facing. For the record, on that occasion I said... I would like to clarify the committee's approach to who we ask to appear before us and the general criteria that we adopt. This is directed towards those from the public sector, including local authorities in particular, although for others our approach is similar. When deciding who to invite, we look to achieve a balance from across the country that covers both rural and urban. We also have in mind coverage from affluent and less affluent areas. We aim to spread the coverage across the whole country, although we recognise that those in the larger urban areas might have more experience and knowledge of particular issues to share with us. We also recognise that staff in the larger urban areas can be more specialised and potentially handle a wider variety of issues. But we are always looking to the impacts on smaller areas too. We consider written submissions and other pertinent inform information before we select witnesses and we are always interested to hear from those who provide an opinion that may differ from the status quo. If we receive submissions that provide similar opinions, we will try to avoid duplication on our panels and we will strive to have contrary views available to test what we are told. When we issue an invitation, we expect witnesses to attend we will cancel an invitation only in exceptional circumstances. These invitations are not like invites to attend government or other working groups, and we do not consider acceptance to be discretionary. We have powers to compel, but we do not want to use them, as we appreciate it that it is far better all round that people attend willingly. If witnesses feel they are not the appropriate person to attend, they should contact the clerk immediately. That will allow an opportunity to discuss whether there might be a better alternative. If witnesses leave it to the last minute to contact the clerks, they will not be allowed to withdraw and we will expect them to attend. 
In this instance, I am going to ask the committee for their views on whether they consider the reasons for Aberdeen City Council's non-attendance today are acceptable and invite comment on what action they would wish to take. Um, I open it up for the committee. I have a suggestion um, that we should summon uh, the original witness, the chief executive uh, of the council uh, and the council leader. Is there any alternative viewpoint to that? So can we agree that we will summon the original witness, the Chief Executive of Aberdeen City Council and the Council Leader? Thank you very much for that agreement. Uh, that uh, is likely to take place on the 2nd of December. Um, I now uh, uh, invite opening statements from Highland Council and Highlight Highland, first of all, please. Thank you, Mr Stewart. Good morning, Committee. Um, I'm Bill Alexander and I'll give an opening statement for myself and Mr Murray. Um, with regard to High Life Highland, which was established as a council-owned company with charitable status in October 2011, so it's four years old now. It was set up with a board of 12 directors, eight of whom are independent and four of whom are councillors, to run adult learning, archives, arts, leisure facilities, libraries, museums, outdoor activity, sport and youth work. Undoubtedly, the initial driver for the Council was the capacity to achieve ongoing savings and protect services, which might otherwise have had to be reduced. However, there were also aspirations that the new body could act more quickly, be more creative and, where appropriate, more commercial, utilising the skills of independent directors whilst retaining a clear focus on public service with strong links to council priorities. How has it been for the council? Well, very good, we would say, in that there have been definite service improvements in a range of areas, for example, libraries, leisure facilities, museums, and an ongoing commitment to council priorities, for example, the integration of adult health and social care or corporate parenting for children. In the past year, the High Life Highland has joined the Community Planning Partnership as a full member as we begin to engage in very real partnership issues. And High Life Highland has also achieved savings, but it's done that largely through increased income and efficiencies, always with a focus on council priorities. It's also begun to develop partnerships with the private sector, and Mr Murray will say more about that. So why has it worked? Well, I would suggest it comes down, in the end, largely to attitudes and relationships. There was a positive challenge from the Council that the High Life Highland Board should have the responsibility and the freedom to improve services. There has been, from the start, a positive approach from the Board to improving and developing services. It's not been about sitting back and simply managing budget reductions. It's been about achieving creativity with focus, a particular focus on the services they provide. High Life Highland has wanted to be and is regarded as a trusted partner by the council and other public bodies. And that approach has built confidence over the first few years, which has helped build the strong and stable relationship we now have. And fundamentally, High Life Highland is popular. It's popular with council members, it's popular with its own staff, and it's popular with the public and with communities. It seemed to be working with the council, but it also has its own identity, and there's a creativity and a focus that that brings. Okay, Mr. Murray, do you have anything to add briefly to that? Not at this stage, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, do the City of Edinburgh and EDI group wish to make an opening statement? Yes, we'll just Mr. Adair. Short opening statement. Good morning. Um, I'm joined this morning by um, Peter Watton, from, um, as Head of Corporate Property from the City of Edinburgh Council. The EDI Group is a wholly owned subsidiary of, of Edinburgh Council. It was established 25 years ago um, with the, the purpose then of leading the development of, of Edinburgh Park, which it did successfully. Today it has two objectives. First, um, to carry out property development in um, specific areas of regeneration. Those areas are specifically identified by Edinburgh Council, and in this case it is Craig Miller and the Granton areas of Edinburgh. The second objective is to take land and buildings which are now surplus to 
the Council's operational needs and to develop those for profit. Examples of our current work would include um, we are designing and building a hotel and a gap site in the old town of Edinburgh. Um, we have designed a new town centre in Craig Miller and we are attracting retailers to that in order to improve the, the local shopping facilities. And we are creating a master plan for the former industrial site at Fountain Bridge and as part of that developing a 300 home, 100 million pounds private rented sector scheme with the support of a joint venture partner. Um, I have been a director of EDI since 2006. Um, Peter has, uh, is currently the, has the privilege of being the Council's observer, um, attending all of, of the EDI board meetings. He has also, uh, for a period of time, worked within EDI, so he's been on both sides of the, of the fence. The board structure has changed um, at various points, various times, um, over the time that I have, have been involved in EDI. It currently um, consists of one executive director, myself, and six non-executive directors. Of those, three are councillors appointed by the council, and three are external independent directors appointed for their experience. There is a shareholders agreement between the council and, and EDI. This was um, reviewed and um, re reworked into and updated in 2014, and that sets out the governance, the practical arrangements of governance between the council and EDI. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, North Lanarkshire Council and Culture NL, Julian Ferry, I think. Yes, thank you, Convener. I would just like to give you some background information to Culture NL. On the 1st of April 2013, operational responsibility for North Lanarkshire Council's cultural and dissociated services transferred to Culture NL. A specially created company, limited by guarantee with charitable status, agreed in accordance with approved charitable objectives and principal activities. The transfer followed a full and transparent options appraisal led, led by KPMG, utilising a toolkit devised by Museums and Galleries Scotland. The Council established Culture NL in order to provide a sustainable future for cultural services, to allow continuous service improvement in the years ahead, to reach new audiences and develop strong partnerships, to enable services to operate in a more responsive way and to undertake new developments, besides making a financial saving on the non-domestic rates. Culture NL is responsible for the management and operation of performance venues, arts development and community arts activity, community facilities, including lighting of school halls and sports pitches, museums and heritage, libraries and information and play services, along with the catering, cleaning and caretaking associated with these above services. Since its inception, Culture NL has embraced its responsibility for delivering services of major importance to the communities of North Lanarkshire. The organisation has flourished in its first two years of operation, placing culture at the centre of our activity, providing a sustainable future for cultural services, recognising the importance of arts and culture in day-to-day -day life and recognising the positive health and wellbeing impact of participation in cultural activity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could you give us uh, an indication of the makeup of the board of yes. Culture NL, please? We have 13 directors on the board, seven of which are independent, and five are partner directors appointed by North Lanarkshire Council. Sorry, six are accounted, appointed by the council. And are they all councillors? Six of them are. Seven six aren't. are councillors. Yes. OK. Um, I understand that Bon Accord Care do not wish to make an opening statement. Could you, Ms Ross, give us uh, an indication of the makeup of the board of Bon Accord Care, please? Uh, certainly. There's two executives. There's myself as um, managing director, our finance director. We have a chairman who, um, and four non-executive directors. There are and no elected members on our board. There are no elected members no. at all. So we the chairman and four others yourself and a finance director. And we also have, at each board meeting, there is an observer, an officer who attends from Aberdeen City Council. So there's a, a, an officer without a vote who attends on behalf yes. of Aberdeen City Council. OK, thank you very much. Um, can I ask, um, uh, first of all, uh, Highland Council and High Life Hi Highland, um, what uh, scrutiny, how does the council scrutinise um, High Life Highland. Mr. Murray. Yes, thanks. Um, there are bi monthly, sorry, biannual meetings of the Education, Culture, uh, er, sorry, excuse me, Adult Children's Bill. Would you please give Education, the right name of it? Children and Adult Services Committee. Sorry. So twice a year, um, I uh, report directly to that committee. 
Um, in between that, there are monthly informal meetings with the Council's leader, uh, the chair of that committee, um, and the convener, the chief executive, um, and Bill. Um, in addition to that, there's quarterly input into the care and learning services performance report, which goes to the Council, um, the Council's chief executive. Um, and the Director of Care and Learning has a standing invitation to the senior management team of High Life Highland. And similarly, I have a standing invitation to the, the management team of the Care and Learning Service. That's on, that's on an as and when basis rather than a, a regular. So there's a range, right, a range right from the committee through to informal meetings. Okay. Uh, in terms of performance indicators, um, are all of your performance indicators available for scrutiny um, at, at, at Council Committee? Yes, they are based on um, the single outcome agreements uh, with the Council and the Government and our, our performance indicators are taken directly from those which affect and are in influencing the nine areas of our work. And are you questioned on those performance indicators by the, the relevant Council bodies that you attend? Yes, I was at the committee just last week and there was a range of questions from youth work right through to leisure facilities on, on almost everything. And is it easy for members of the public to, to scrutinise what you're up to too? We're developing, uh, as part of our integrated health and social care arrangements, um, increasingly local community planning forums. And in the future we see those as the hub for community and public engagement. Mr Murray has recently been to those and engaged in discussion about the range of activities of High Life Highland. And that's where we expect both public community council and also community organisations to be in involved in that. I wouldn't say that was scrutiny. It's discussion about local delivery. Uh, scrutiny happens in the council committee and in the officer processes and reporting in the performance framework. I would suggest though that High Life Highland also has a very high profile um, and there's very active community debate and discussion about the delivery of services and High Life Highland is very much part of that. Okay, uh, in terms of scrutiny at uh, City of Edinburgh uh, regarding EDI, how is that carried out? Um, the, the shareholders agreement um, sets out a number of requirements. Um, Broadly, that would include the, um, the submission of all board papers have to be provided to the observer, um, and that includes um, a number of um, specified finance reports. Um, so those are provided to the observer. They are also provided um, to the council's head of finance um, on a monthly basis. Um, the council also, the, the shareholders' agreement also requires the preparation of a, an annual business plan looking three years ahead um, in the first instance that is submitted to the council um, as to council officers for their input and review and then it is then submitted to the council's economy committee for approval um, I am also there is also ad hoc summons to to other committees I've just recently um, been asked or I was um, I attended the council's housing committee to um, present what we were doing in relation to housing delivery in our areas of development. Okay, and North Lanarkshire and Culture NL. Thank you. At present, quarterly reports are presented by myself as the contract manager uh, to the Learning and Leisure Services Committee of North Lanarkshire Council. In addition to that, there is an officers meeting between the Head of Financial Services at North Lanarkshire Council and myself with the Chief Executive and her team uh, to look at performance measures, the financial position uh, of Culture NL. I also have meetings with the Chief Executive on an ad hoc basis regarding strategic matters. Okay, and Ms Ross, in terms of Aberdeen City Council scrutiny of Bon Accord Care? Okay. We have um, a contractual, our contract states out our finance arrangements, which are monthly, we report monthly to the Council on our finance. We also have service level agreements which are in place, which um, stipulate our KPIs. Our key performance indicators are reported on a weekly basis. We also have ones that are reported on a monthly basis. 
We have um, operational um, management meetings on a monthly basis. We also meet with the, um, which was the Director of Social Work and now it's the IJB on monthly to discuss the KPI and the outcomes of those. We have to prepare an annual report and present that to Council. We also um, share our annual accounts once they're audited. We present at the Alio Governance Hub, which is presented on a couple of times a year, and a couple of, uh, sorry, throughout the year. And we have to report again on our KPIs and we'll be asked um, how our boards operate in um, strategic areas that we're moving forward, a, a whole range of issues there. We have um, obviously freedom of information on our website. We have a, a robust complaints and a comments procedure which is in place, which is well utilised by our service users and members of the public. Um, we also use local committees such as sheltered housing committees and things for access to allow us to gain a good understanding and allow us to be, have direct contact with our um, sheltered housing uh, service users. There, yep. um, please, uh, Ms Ross. From what you've said there, the only opportunity for the council, councillors, to scrutinise Bon Accord Care is at the presentation of your annual report, is that right? Uh, no, the Alio Governance Hub, that was the shareholder scrutiny group. Um, could could you tell us about the Alio Governance Hub then? Who yeah. is on that? The Alio, the Alio Governance Hub is our officers at which we all the Alios present. And the Alio Governance Hub. The, what I'm interested in here oh, is... Um, the opportunity for councillors to, to scrutinise right, okay, what's going yeah. on. Um, obviously, the others have said which committees they're responsible to. Okay. In your case, um, how does Aberdeen City Council um, councillors scrutinise what, you, what you're doing? Okay, so the Alio Governance Hub asks the specific questions that have been asked for by the Audit and Risk Committee. They then pre prepare and send the report goes to that Audit and Risk Committee, and we attend to that as well. So we're um, open there for questions from directly from councillors. And how often does that happen? Um, others are saying that they have to go quarterly in the case of Highland and, and others. How often do you have to attend the Audit and Risk Committee at Aberdeen City Council? Sorry, I, um, I can't answer that question at the moment. I could come back to you with that. It's, I, okay. We've attended about three or four times. It's, I'm not okay. sure of the frequency. Thank you. John Wilson, please. Good morning. Thank you, Convener. Uh, just to go back to Mr Alexander's opening remarks. Mr Alexander, you made reference to the reason for setting up High Life was because the, it's a council-owned company, but it was seen for savings, increased aspiration, uh, you know, partnership with the private sector and improving service delivery. The question I would put is, could, why could those things not happen under local authority total control? Why did, was it felt that it had to go out to an arm's length organisation before these things can happen? Mr Alexander. Yep, that's, what was, that's the $64 billion question, and it's one that we ask ourselves quite a lot. Uh, undoubtedly, the initial motivation was about the fact that the cost base of the arm's length organisation would allow savings to be made. Um, that clearly is with regard to domestic rates. Um, but it was also felt that it could give a focus and it could bring a creativity to services that might otherwise be threatened. I don't think there was a particular scientific analysis of that. I don't think we necessarily knew what would happen. I think we set around the arm's length organisation a policy framework and some parameters within which to operate, and we then encouraged it to, to fly. And I think it has flown. I think there is some magic dust I don't know if that's in part because it isn't the council, that it has an identity, that it has a loyalty. It certainly has a focus around what its business is. It also has a degree of creativity. It has great passion from its independent directors who bring a range of skills to the board. It also has a passion from its staff who enjoy the identity and I don't think would want to come back to the council. So it's a range of issues. Some of the 
of those I think we can quantify and talk about. Others are less able to articulate, but it's about passion, creativity and focus, um, which is more than a council that delivers a whole range of services perhaps could bring to these particular remits. Could you expand on the savings? You made reference to domestic rates, the savings on domestic rates. What other savings have been made? Surely it's not just about saving in domestic rates. Has there been changes to staff terms and conditions? No. Has there been no introduction of zero-hour contracts? No. Issues like that, because I've heard in other alios some of the, the issues that have been raised, and a number of alios will make the same argument that the savings outweighed uh, no remaining part of the council. Uh, could you, has it okay. just been the savings in terms of the domestic rates? And no, no, there's savings? been further, m many more savings than that. The intention was never to achieve savings through changes to staff terms and conditions. That was quite clear. It was to be savings from the business in terms of getting in income and also in terms of efficiencies. I'd suggest that Mr Murray might be able to bring detail to that, if that's a, all right. Mr Murray. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, certainly, we've absolutely um, always been focused on not changing staff terms and conditions. The non-domestic rates and the VAT treatment that's available to a charity is different to that of a council and therefore the council is making approximately £1.1 million worth of savings simply from, from those two, the VAT and the non-domestic rates. But since, um, since leaving um, the, the council's direct control, um, the, that ability to focus that Bill was talking about, um, as, as he says, there, there is a bit of magic dust in there, but it, it, it absolutely, the staff feel part of a, a manageable organisation, and that somehow has led to a greater degree of focus in terms of uh, generating more income through our leisure centres, which is our most, uh, that's where most of our income comes from. But also an, a, a, a small but um, specific example, for example, um, donations at the Highland Folk Museum in Newton Moor. Um, that's a free entry museum, but um, attendances there have gone up from 16,000 to 44,000 in the last couple of years, and the donations levels have gone up nearly three times as much as they were uh, when we left the council. And that's simply about um, staff having a, a perhaps a better um, feeling of oneness with the organisation, understanding that it's important that we need to get donations up in order to protect services. Um, and it is difficult to explain why that can't be, why that wasn't achieved in the council, and I was the head of service within the council, but it just seems to be setting it free a little bit. Staff identification allows them to really focus on the business. Can I just go back to Mr Alexander's opening remarks? Mr Alexander, I've got you quoted as saying the High Life was a council wholly owned company. So if it's a council wholly owned company, then why do staff who work for High Life feel that they're part of a separate entity or an entirely separate entity and seem more uh, encouraged to work for that separate entity than they do for the council when effectively this is a wholly owned company in your own words uh, that is actually control owned, controlled uh, and effectively all bar the day-to-day -day running of the organisation uh, owned uh, and directed by the council? I'm not sure how aware the staff will be of the back office joins. What they see is a standalone independent company of around six, seven hundred people, many of whom they know personally, a chief executive they know personally, with its own branding, with its own high profile. He has ties, he has badges, you can get a jacket with the, la with the label on. Um, it has an identity. People talk about High Life. We have a High Life membership scheme. The public and the communities want to be part of the High Life membership scheme. It just has a brand and identity that, that works, that is seen to be separate from the council. We don't, I suppose, in terms of governance, rigidly pull every single string that makes High Life Highland work. It has a degree of freedom and autonomy within the overall priorities, parameters and policies of the council. We haven't yet come to any issue that would break that trusting relationship and perhaps with the budget challenge that's down the road that might get more difficult but to be date to, to date that's worked thank you very much indeed mr alexander 
Convener, can I turn to uh, questions for North Lanarkshire Council? And I need to make a declaration at this stage that I, I know the services fairly well as I rent some of the premises for my surgeries and I'm aware of some of the, the intricacies I would describe it as that exist within North Lanarkshire. Because not only do we have Cultural NL and we have representatives of, uh, speaking on behalf of Cultural NL here today, but we also have NL Leisure, which is another organisation operated uh, as an arm's length organisation by the council that also has premises, leisure facilities and other uh, premises. But I'm interested in the comment that was made by Ms Ferry when she made reference to the Culture NL running services uh, on operating services, particularly education services. Now, one of the issues that's been raised with me uh, by constituents is the fact when you try to book a council hall, as the the local uh, language for it, uh, you can be sent to anything up to three different departments before you'd actually get an answer whether or not you can book the hall. Because as some of the facilities are owned by and controlled by the education service up till five o'clock in the evening, then uh, some of them can be owned and operated by uh, NL Leisure and others can be then owned or operated by Culture NL. In relation to the conflict that exists there, can I ask why the Council, North Lanarkshire Council, didn't just make the decision to transfer some of the Culture NL services to NL Leisure instead of setting up an entirely different organisation? Ms Ferry. Thank you very much. Culture NL certainly do um, let community facilities after five o'clock in schools and the pitches associated with them as well. And Mr Wilson's right, North Lanarkshire Leisure are a sports trust and they operate pitches as well. Um, within Culture NL, we have one booking system and within our booking system, we can see any facility that we operate um, so that you would only come to us once if you were actually trying to hire a facility from us or a sports pitch from us. I believe it's slightly different for North Lanarkshire Leisure who focus specifically on areas. So um, they would focus on Airdrie Sports Centre or Ravens Craig. They don't have the same booking system as us. Um, I, c I can't speak for the council as to why they didn't transfer the sports pitches at the time when they established Culture NL, but I would say Culture NL is much wider than sport. Um, we, while we do hire pitches, we can hire a pitch for anything. It doesn't have to be for a sporting activity. It could be for a gala day. Uh, it could be for any, anything at all. Um, so we, we are not responsible for what is on the pitch, but we hire the pitch, whereas North Lanarkshire Leisure, I would say, are, are different because they do have football clubs and, and different sporting clubs that they, they would use their pitches for. I, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Maybe Ms McMurray could explain the Council's reasoning for the decision. At the time when the Council were considering through an option appraisal process the establishment of a separate cultural trust, at that point in time, what was Learning Leisure Services, formerly the Education Service, had one process for booking community facilities and school facilities, regardless of whether they were sports or whether they were cultural facilities. The Council found it very difficult, I would say, to split school use down into a compartmentalised approach where it would be, this is about a community learning activity, therefore it has to be booked out in a particular way. This is about a cultural activity and this is about a sports activity. It was about a holistic approach to better use of the school estate. So we felt at that point in time to fragment it into, well, a third generation sports pitch should be booked by a, a leisure trust rather than it should be about community use and community access to schools. So that was the rationale originally for keeping that approach and vesting that in one particular uh, of the alleos. However, what we have done, which was, has perhaps muddied the waters, we have one particularly uh, large enhanced facility, St Ambrose High School in Cote Bridge, which has a lot of sports and community facilities, particularly sports facilities. And being a council that is, is constantly looking at pushing the boundaries of trying to find best practice and best value, we appreciated that, that there may be a sports element to that, that it was important to consider whether the Leisure Trust should operate it or not. So we put in place a pilot for that particular facility to have a look at. Would it be more appropriate to be operated by 
a trust whose thinking was very much about sport. That perhaps has led to some confusion within the community about, well, how do you book during the day for the community aspect of that and how do you book in the evening for the, the sports element of it? So to answer the question, I think we are still evolving our approach. And when we established Culture NL, it was about it was predominantly cultural services and the points that have been made previously around that importance of the focus and that, what that brings to an arm's length organisation, we didn't say we would never consider a merger between the two alios and at a point in time that may be a consideration for the council. Can I ask the same question I asked earlier, convener, in terms of the savings that have been made to North Lancashire Council in relation to the establishment of the the alios because as you quite identified NL Leisure was, has been established for a, I think it was 2009 uh, and then we've had the 2013 we had Culture NL established uh, over the period uh, what savings have been made uh, and what changes have taken place uh, to allow those savings to be made Thank you. Um, in our first year, it was mainly the non-domestic rate saving. So 2013-14 saw us save £1.15 million. Pounds. Um, that was the domestic rate saving. In the second year, we had a further efficiency saving to make of nearly £700,000. And by that time, we had had a year to bed in. We were, we were a new organisation and we had increased our income generation. We had a very lean management structure. There is me and there are 14 managers. You know, there's, there's not a hierarchy. A question here because I, I want to get my head around the non-domestic rates situation. Um, while it seems clear to me in terms of high life, the transfer of properties to high life would make that saving in non-domestic rates. But what you've just discussed in the exchanges with Mr. Wilson um, is the fact that you are doing booking for... Um, for lights in schools and, and various other things. So obviously those have not transferred to you. So how could there be non-domestic rate saving in that regard? I take it there is none. The, the, the saving was the result of the non-domestic... We did, we did save £1.1 million in non-domestic rate saving as, as a result of the establishment of Culture Enel. But in terms of, your, of a lot of your activity, which seems to cross into educational establishments and the rest, there won't be any non-domestic rate savings there, am I right in saying? We would save them the non-domestic rates on the museums, the libraries and the community facilities, not the schools. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we have, we have probably... I, I just wanted to clarify <laughs> that. Um, sorry, John. That's OK. Can you... uh, so in our second year, um, we had to save £695,000. And as I was saying, um, a lot of that was through increased income. Uh, by that time, we, we had managed to bed in and we knew what we were trying to do following the set-up of the Trust. Um, we benefited greatly from venues and catering merging. Previously, catering sat within environmental services and the venues, the concert halls, the theatres, sat within learning and leisure and there was no joined up working at all. When Culture NL came into being, the, the leisure catering transferred as well and so we've benefited greatly from that, particularly in income generation and customer development um, from those two services merging and they are located in the same building as well, so they work as one team. So we, we benefited greatly from that. that, that helped towards our savings. We do have a very lean management structure, as I was saying, and we have very careful vacancy management. And out of that, we did secure the second year's saving. John? The question follow to follow up on that, convener, is in relation to terms and conditions for staff that transferred under the 2P regulations and other staff that were taken on, uh, do you employ staff on zero-hour contracts? I know Ms McMurray will have heard this question asked mm -hmm. in the Council Chamber on a number of occasions, uh, but in relation to zero-hour contracts, terms and conditions, are those the same terms and conditions and uh, rates of pay that would, be, would have been enjoyed if they were employed or continued to be employed by the Council? Yes, they are. We haven't changed the term and conditions and we work with the Council's job evaluation scheme, so everyone is on the same rates of pay as they were. So, so when I go into my surgery on a Monday morning and I see a notice on the notice board from Culture NL advertising vacancies saying that there's flexible working mm -hmm. and, and some time ago 
There used to be a, a positive, there was a poster that used to say, talked about zero hour contracts. Uh, but certainly flexible working is still within that uh, notice that I see regularly at my surgeries. So how, how those changes, in, uh, have, there, have there been savings in relation to staff going on to more flexible contracts? We haven't changed the contracts. People have applied to work flexibly as they're able to. And we do have a number of people who do undertake flexible working um, within Culture NL. We have no one in a zero-hour contract. We've never advertised for a zero-hour contract. We do have casual staff. Um, for example, the front of house staff who work at the Concert Hall and Theatre are casual. They can't be given contracts because they are as and when required, and they, they know that. Um, and it's always been the case. So nothing has changed since we became Culture NL. Define the difference between a casual contract and a zero-hours contract. I know we do not issue anyone in a zero-hours contract. Um, the casual staff apply to be as, as casual staff. For example, the pantomime is just about to start, so we would employ more front-of-house staff in order for the pantomime to take place. Um, so we, we would advertise for short periods of working. People know that they will be rooted, but we don't, we don't say they're zero-hours contract. Right. You just say they're casual staff. They are casual staff, right. yes. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed, Convener. That's all my questions. Um, before we move off, uh, and I take in uh, Jane Baxter, I just want to um, make sure that we get details about terms and conditions from all of the witnesses. Um, could you give us the EDI position in terms of terms and conditions? Are, are the folks who work for you in the same terms and conditions that they would have had uh, when they were working for the Council? No, they're... they're EDI employs people on separate terms and conditions from the Council. Um, there are, I don't think there are any employees now who actually have transferred from the Council. Um, there were some back 25 years ago, clearly people transferred from the Council then, but 2 p probably didn't apply then. Yet. Um, so I don't know what terms and conditions they transferred over on. Currently, um, all employees of EDI were recruited um, privately into EDI. Do you have any comment on that, Mr. Wharton, from a council point of view? Uh, no. Um, we have, in the past, took a staff from EDI into the council and have respected the terms and conditions of their contract in that process. Um, it is well known that EDI, when they advertise on the wider market, are offering different terms and conditions than what the council can offer. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why they were set up in the ability to, uh, to attract uh, better commercial talent. And do you have any zero hours contracts? No. No. Um, Ms Ross, in terms of terms and conditions at Bon Accord Care, um, are they the same as uh, staff had previously? Yes, they are. Uh, and that includes new recruits as well? Yes. Uh, and do you have any zero hour co contracts? No. No. Uh, and high life, any zero hour contracts, because you already explained the position? Yep. As we were leaving the Council, zero-hours contracts were being discussed and there are a limited number of zero-hours contracts for people who, like coaches, who are employed for three or four hours a week, where there, is a, where there needs to be a mutual, mutuality of... Um, what's the, the terminology? A mutuality of uh, requirement to turn up. So if you have a, a completely casual relationship with a member of staff uh, for... a, a a fitness coach, for example, um, they can decide that next Tuesday they're not going to bother to turn up, which is difficult to maintain um, a public face. What a zero-hour contract does in those limited number of uh, cases is make sure that there's a mutuality of you must turn up. If we're giving you these three hours a week, you have to turn up. Do you think that the staff that you have who are on zero-hour contracts are happy with the arrangements that you have? We have, we've not, I'm not aware of any uh, complaints. We don't stop. Uh, there's no suggestion that they can't work for anybody else. It fits into their lifestyle that they're, they're doing. So you've got no exclusivity. Folk can do what they want in terms of other work Absolutely. and all the rest. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's simply to make sure that we know that they're going to be turning up at the times that we've arranged with them. Thank you. Jane Baxter, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, I was going to ask about zero hours, but I think that's been answered. Um, but I'd like to ask about um, employee involvement. Generally, um, I'm, a I'm asking all of you, um, I expect an answer from, from each of you, if that's, if that's possible today. Um, uh, does anybody have things like employee representation on the board? Um, what's the situation with trade union involvement? 
Um, many of you have said that your staff are happy, and um, that's good to hear, but do you do any staff surveys? How, how, can, how do you test that? How are staff involved in the operation of your companies, um, and what's the relationship with trade unions? Uh, Ms Ross, please, first of all. OK. Um, we have, uh, I meet with the, our union representatives every month and have done since we went live, um, so that continues. Um, and we share a lot of our, uh, our key operational figures with them. We discuss points and move forward, so there's a good, relationship, good working relationships there. Um, with regards to our staff, I have a quarterly staff forum um, that is attended. It's an open agenda, so there's representations from every one of our services and um, all our staff, and they attend one session in the morning, one in the afternoon. It's an open forum by staff. They can address and raise any questions that they choose. Anything that's been raised from solar panels to uniforms, it depends on... It's, it's anything there. We then take the points from the staff forum and we put them into action points, such as um, you asked and what we did, and that then goes into our quarterly newsletter, and we have a staff newsletter, and we make sure that each of our staff members has their own individual copy. Previously, um, they went up on notice boards, and we found that some of our staff who are community-based and don't have a lot of access didn't have them, so we either use hard copies or we use electronic copies, but ensure that everyone has a copy of that. We do uh, staff surveys every, um, every quarter, so encouraging staff to <laughs> complete those in. Um, we, do, we use those. All of our um, services have to have regular staff engagement meetings, so every month that we have those as well. And we've encouraged recently some um, increase in trade union stewards within our organisation. And we also have health and safety meetings, which our staff are um, their uh, ground-based staff, which they have there. Thank you. Thank you. We have one trade union director and one employee director on the board. And I meet with the joint trade unions, three of them, on a monthly basis, along with our HR manager, and that's their union um, negotiation and liaison. Um, with regards to staff, we have undertaken one employee survey and since we've come into being, and we have about 700 staff who work for Culture Enel. 41% of those people responded to the first survey, which we thought was very encouraging. And 82% of those respondents said that they were proud to work for Culture Enel. So we're taking that as the basis to work from. Um, we have a number of staff working groups, particularly focusing on things like health and safety, um, which are chaired by other members of staff and include members of staff from each of the groups within Culture Enel. Um, and we have one-to-one -one meetings on a regular basis and monthly team meetings as well. We also do a kind of annual review for all the staff, um, and that's emailed out to or put notice boards so everyone has a copy of that. It's a kind of highlight report each year. And I would um, engage all the staff where they need to be, you know, if there's anything of importance. For example, savings have just come out, so we've had to tell everyone about the savings. So there's quite a lot of email contact. Thank you. Here, please. Um, there are no employee uh, representatives on the, the EDI board. We're a small company. We only have 16 employees. Um, so our, the engagement between board um, executive and staff is, is very open and very informal. Um, there are two members of staff, um, I believe, who are members of trade unions. Thank you. Mr Murray. Um, all staff have a personal development plan meetings twice a year, and any trends that are emerging from that are reported to the senior management team. Um, on a quarterly basis, we meet with the three unions involved in our, and that involves uh, staff representations at that. There are staff on the health and safety um, committee as well. We have a Every second year, we run a company-wide staff survey, and the results of that are reported directly to the board with any action plan that comes out of that. And, and we have a, a staff, in common with others, I'm sure, we have a staff awards um, ceremony where we're rewarding um, ex excellence. Well, um, just to pick up then, I'm, I'm going to ask about um, the living wage. Um, and... Um, the Scottish living wage has just gone up to £8.25 an hour. Um, many councils have declared themselves to be living wage employers and have become accredited as living wage employers. And I know that many arm's length organisations who rely on council funding find it difficult to get that accreditation because they don't have the continuity of, of the certainty of the funding going forward. So I'd like to ask about the living wage. Is your council a living wage employer? And are, is your ALIO able to be a living wage employer or are there issues about the funding that prevent that from being the case? I'm going to ask the councillors first and then I'll ask the ALIOs. Obviously, you're in a tricky position, Ms Ross, and we'll ask the council later. Um, Mr Alexander, is Highland Council a living wage employer? Yes, it is. And uh, in terms of high life? Yeah. 
uh, a living wage employer to you, Mr Murray. Yeah. Uh, Edinburgh, City of Edinburgh Council? Yes. Yes, and EDI Group? And we follow that and apply the living wage. Okay. Um, and North Lanarkshire Council? Yes. And uh, Culture NL? Yes. Um, and is Bon Accord Care a living wage employer, Ms Ross? We are. We're currently applying. Okay. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Uh, Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much, <coughs> convener. Do, I'm more interested in the non-executive directorships. Do all AIOs have non-executive members? And also, how are they recruited? Are they recruited internally or externally? Um, we will go to High Life first, please. Yes, uh, out of our 12 on the board, four councillors, so we look for eight independent non-executive directors, and they're advertised... Um, uh, openly in the newspapers and through community planning partnership websites and things like that. And then they, they come in for a, a, a general discussion and that gets it down to a short lead and we, we then have a nominations committee which uh, makes its nomination and then the, the final recommendation goes to the council for sign-off. Nominations committee. Yeah. <laughs> um, director of Care and Learning from the council and two directors from the existing board. Okay. So there's a fair amount of council input then into that nominations committee, and then that has to be signed off by the council? The, the individual person that needs so to be signed if, off. So if somebody doesn't meet the, the council's wishes, then the council can veto that non-executive director? They could. We okay. also use a skills matrix to look at the range of qualities we'd want on this particular board and indeed that matrix has now been used more widely across other council services. Okay. In terms of EDI in the City of Edinburgh? Uh, it's very similar. Up until two years ago there was no non-execs on the board um, but the revamp of the company and the rewriting of the shareholders agreement uh, brought in three non-execs. They were advertised for uh, in the press. There was an interview process that the panel comprised of senior members of the administration, myself and senior HR representative, uh, interviewed and nominations were recommended to the council. So the council could again veto any non-executive director that it didn't like? Technically that's correct, yes. Okay. Um, and in terms of North Lanarkshire? Yes, we have 13 directors on the board, seven of which are independent. The trade union director was appointed by the trade unions. The employee director was balloted um, through all staff group. They were, so they were appointed by the staff themselves. The other five independent directors were appointed following open advert. Like the other authorities here, we, we have a skills matrix for what we require on the board. We, we know where we have some gaps on the board and we would like to fill. Um, so we developed a skills matrix. We went to open advert. We ran a workshop for all the interested applicants and then it went to an interview process. The interview was conducted by three members of the board and then it is taken to the Learning and Leisure Committee for ratification. Again, the council could veto any one that they didn't want. Am I correct in saying that? Yes, they could, but it hasn't happened. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wilson, if it's Thank on you, this you, point. Yeah, it's on that point, convener. It's just that you said that in terms of culture NL, they were interviewed by three members of the board. I'm assuming that the three members of the board were elected members. Initially, they were when we first appointed the, the, the first lot of independent directors. So we had five vacancies initially, and we only had elected members of the, as the shadow board at the time. We've had since another vacancy on the board, and that the second panel consisted of two elected members and an independent director. And for Bon Accord, Care. The, I have to say the board um, had been advertised and appointed when I came into post and our board is still current that we started with. We haven't had any vacancies. So you, have you any... Sorry, I, we've got five non-execs. Yes. yes, have you any Sorry. idea how those folks were appointed? My understanding is that we're externally advertising and they were interviewed and appointed through the council. Do you know who did the interviews, Ms Ross? The local authority. Council. Councillors or officers? Sorry, I can't answer that. I'm not sure. OK, thank you. Cameron? But I was interested also... Do you look for, you referred to looking for particular skills, does that include commercial expertise and external skills generally just to try and balance the non-execs? We're getting lots of nods of heads there. Mr right. Alexander, do you want to give comment on that? No, very definitely. Um, that would be something we particularly want to look for. We might also look for interests in particular areas of activity. If we don't have anyone with a sports background or we don't have anyone from a third sector background, we'd look for those as well. 
but certainly we, we would want to make sure there were people from a commercial background. Any of the others want to comment on that? No, Cameron? That's fine, thank you. Sure. Ms Ross, you're in a, a very unusual position in the fact that um, there are no elected members uh, on your board. And I'm not going to ask you to comment on that because that's uh, Aberdeen City Council's bag and we will get the opportunity to speak to them later. Um, but I want to ask the other councils that are here before we move off this topic, if they could ever um, see a scenario where there would be no councillors on their board. Ms McMurray. In terms of, of culture NL, at the moment we have an elected member who chairs the board. I think if there, if there was to be a development in terms of uh, culture NL at the point at which the board um, independent directors are to be appoint, reappointed or, or we bring in new members that we may consider whether the chair should be an independent That wasn't director. my question. My question my was, apologies. do you ever envisage a position uh, where there would be no elected members on the board of Culture NL or any other North Lanarkshire Alley? It's a difficult decision for me to, to, to say that yes or no to, because I think that would be for the council to decide and for the elected members to decide whether they were minded to do that. Okay. Mr Walton. Uh, do I envisage that there ever will be a, a board of EDI without councillors on it? No. Thank um, you. The board, as I previously said, was predominantly councillors. I think at one point there was seven, uh, along with three executives. The council acknowledged that that was the wrong mix in terms of moving forward and agreed to change the, um, the make-up to three councillors, three non-execs and one executive. Mr Alexander. Can I suggest that there's perhaps a prequel to the question, which is what is the role of the councillor on a board? And I think that's something that we wrestle with. And it's not just about ALOs. It's about, for example, councillors on NHS boards. A councillor on the High Life Board is a member of the High Life Board. They're not the council at the board. And it's quite difficult to work out what that's about. It isn't about governance. We don't operate governance through the council of being on the board. That happens within council committees. It's about partnership and it's about communications. High Life Highland, however, is a council-owned company. Now, if that was to change, that would have to be members to change that, not officers. I don't envisage that would change because the council likes having the council-owned company and it wants that partnership. I think what's quite interesting is that High Life Highland is developing into new areas that aren't council activity. It's developing private partnerships with agencies that don't have relationships with the council. So we are going to new areas, but I think the council would still want to have members on the board. They would still see it as a council-owned company, but that isn't where they exert governance. Um, we'll come back to that probably. Uh, will I call for you, please? Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions about income generation and that, that side of your work. I think perhaps one of the great hopes uh, when Alios were conceived you know, was that they would open up new opportunities for funding streams that weren't available to, to our councils, and that was one of the clear uh, purposes, I think, and reasons behind establishing many of them. So, I mean, by and large, has that been a route that you have uh, explored, and has that been successful? For you. Who's going to answer that? Mr Murray? I think it, the hopes are greater than the reality, um, but there are, there are limited funds that are available to non-council organisations, and we, we, have, we have gone looking for them, but the, <clears throat> I think the flexibility of being an arm's length organisation, uh, for example, being able to get into partnership with the private sector. Um, we're just beginning to develop that. So for ex a, a specific example, at this, a small Inverness Botanic Gardens uh, in Inverness, we are, we've um, had a three-way capital funding partnership between a private catering organisation, um, the Inverness Common Good Fund, and the Council's own capital funds to completely um, upgrade the visitor um, services, cafe, etc. 
uh, that was able that we were able to do that because we were acting as the sort of halfway house broker between we don't have a great deal of experience in commercial catering but that facility was crying out for a decent a decent cafe uh, the council didn't have that at the top of its list of, for capital funding but by being able to bring in a third of the money that was needed from the private sector that opened up doors through the other two funders so um, just going out there and getting grants that aren't available to councils, that, that's overstated in, in many people's minds, but it does exist. But it does, the flexibility allows us to do other things. I want to come in on those points, Mr Adair. Yeah, and the, I think the, effectively the fundamental reason why EDI exists and why um, the common view that EDI should exist is that its purpose is to create income. Um, and the view is that by operating as an arm's length entity from the council with a specific focus on property development, that entity should be able to realise greater property values than it would if the same activity was undertaken within the council. So that is our fundamental purpose. And I think, yes, um, <laughs> apart from 2009, 10, 11, when there was some other major circumstances impacting on us. But prior to that, um, we made, um, we paid approximately, I think it's about £60 million in dividends to the council over the previous 20 years. Um, we are returning back to a profitable position and we are budgeting to pay dividends to the council in the coming years. Um, Ms Ferry. Yes, thank you. Um, I would agree with a colleague from Aberdeen. We do secure a reasonable level of external funding and um, we'll probably bring in about half a million pounds of our income in the last year was through external funding. I don't know that very many of the sources were new sources. Um, we attract a lot through Museums and Galleries Scotland, um, Creative Scotland, uh, organisations like that. I think being a charity ourselves has, a le has let us apply for more trust funding. Um, it may be ones that you wouldn't, wouldn't be applicable to a local authority, but they're usually for a small amount of money. Actually, so I don't think yet we've managed to make great inroads there. Ms Ross? We're currently exploring um, opportunities for um, looking at more different sources of funding at the moment. Could you give us an indication of what those may be? Uh, yes, certainly. Um, the, we have, the, the way our, uh, our contract is set up, the, our, the, the funding that comes across is for the commission services that we have um, through the local authority. So any other additional services that we provide have to be funded independently through that. So we're currently exploring the use. Um, we'll have a pilot that's looking to start looking at more um, traditional home help services, for example. OK, will I? Thank you. Thanks very much for that. In, in terms of the kind of leisure-related um, services that you, you provide, could you give me some idea, though, if your improved performance in terms of your income is as a result of just putting prices up, or is it by generating new income streams and income markets? Jill, I'm not picking on you, but you said you had to save £695,000 and you managed to do it. So did you have to cut that, or did you make that income from other sources through price increases or developing new services? Okay. Um, obviously, we've developed a few new services. Um, we, ha we do increase the prices every year in accordance. We always have, as part of the Council, we increase the prices by 3% every year. Um, it's quite a small amount of money when you add it all on to, to community lets, for example, it could be a 10 pence on a let, it's not a massive amount of money. But what we've done, what we've found through Culture and Ale is by bringing the organisation together, we're working more closely together, the, the managers, the teams are beginning to de develop their working patterns much more closely together and that lets us focus on the culture as opposed to everyone doing different things and we've come together as one organisation which has let us develop activity and we have a, a cultural festival called Encounters which was established in the council however we've managed to grow that it's, it takes place every month eh, sorry every year in October we now have a, an Easter Encounters a Summer Encounters we're looking at Adult Learning Week which is next week it's branded Encounters we're beginning to roll out that brand with um, input from everyone, all, all the sections within the organisation. Um, so I think we have developed new, new working streams. I mentioned earlier the link between catering and venues. That's been very successful um, and has let us bring substantial income in. Um, it also, as we build the catering income, lets us slightly change the programming that we do. It allows us to take a bit more of a risk going forward with the programming. So we would be very careful previously to, to book activity that we knew we'd, we could get lots of people to attend. I think as we go on, we develop, we become a bit less risk aware, um, risk averse, sorry, and 
it lets us spread the cultural activity across and develop new audiences that way. That's where we're aiming to go. <clears throat> just, just, could none of that happen, though, unless you were an alien? That improved performance and that income generation, and could, could that not have been possible? I don't think you would have had the same focus, to be honest, um, because previously I was creative services manager, so I worked with the, the venue side of things and the community arts activity within the council. Now we've got libraries on board, we've got museums and heritage on board. Um, so you're bringing together a much more diverse group of people who all have culture at, at the heart as well, so we, we can play in each other's strengths, use each other's strengths to, to, to widen the offer. And we're hoping in time that that brings in new audiences as well. In terms of public perception about how happy they are, I think Bill, not picking on you either, but you said the public like it is popular with the communities. How do you generally assess public perception? How do you measure your performance and your public acceptance and support for you, the work that you do? I think there's two particular issues to that. I think, firstly, the pricing scheme has gone down well. I mean, Ian describes it as stack them high, sell them cheap. It's been about a, a mass volume membership scheme, which is very popular. So take up is high. Um, if you're looking at libraries, if you're looking at leisure centres, if you're looking at some of the museums that Mr Murray has spoken about, footfall is up and, and usage is up. We also um, have a citizens panel, as we call it in Highland. It's a, a representative sample of just over 2,000 people. Um, which cuts across the all Highland communities and uh, High Life services figure very prominently in the positive satisfaction rates from that. And the others, how do you measure public uh, satisfaction? I think EDI is somewhat different in that regard, ah, yeah, is yes. it not? Uh, not sure. the public service. So, um, but Ms Ross, in terms of public satisfaction about Bonacord Care? We have um, surveys, we do service user surveys and attend um, local meetings. Those are part of our uh, recognised KPIs that we report back. North Lana, yeah. how do you do it? It would be a variety of methods, including surveys carried out by Culture NL, the residents' survey. We also report to committee as part of that quarterly monitoring process on the number of comments and complaints there are and the nature of these um, as well. Thanks very much. Thank you, Willie. Um, before we move off of that, um, how many folk in the general public actually see the difference between the Leisure Trust or the Care Trust um, and the Council? Uh, because on a visit recently to Inverclyde, um, you know, I think uh, if you were to ask members of the public, which we did, um, they thought it was still council. So in terms of high life, in terms of the general public, what, what do, do they think? Do they think, see the difference? I think that's an, another very pertinent question. I, I've been in this room before being asked about health services and social work services, and sometimes I think the public don't really know who provides. They just want the service, and I still get letters of complaints about services that the council don't provide. But I think around the arm's length organisations. There is a bit of an identity that is different and I think people understand that that isn't the same service that picks up the bins and, and provides social work or schools. I think there is a, an awareness that it's different but I don't know if the, count, if, if the public in general have got a very sophisticated understanding of that. I don't know if Mr Murray wants to add. I would agree with that. There, this, there, there is, it's, it looks both ways. There's both a separate identity, but at the same time, occasionally we get comments, but, but you're the council, aren't you? Um, and I'm not sure it matters. And Bonacord Care? Um, Ms Ross? I think there is an understanding that there, there is a difference, but I would probably echo um, what Mr Alexander and Mr Murray said. Okay, and from the North Lanarkshire perspective? I think from the Council's perspective, we are concerned on the, the quality of the service provided and that there is a confidence in the brand that is Culture NL. But we haven't specifically asked the question of the public as yet. We're just about to undertake a reputation survey and we'll see what comes back from that one. Okay, George Adam, please. Yeah, just to follow on from that point,
point of view, uh, I used to be a member of Remshire Leisure in, uh, when I was a councillor, Remshire Council, and there was, the count as far as everybody was concerned, the leisure services were still the council. If swimming pool paths went up, it was the council that did it. You know, so I think the, I know Mr Alexander said that the brand seems to be going well. Remshire Leisure tried to create the brand and it didn't. It was still, as far as they're concerned, the council. But one of my uh, issues that I have, and it's fallen on from what my colleague Mr Coffey said was the fact that, you know, one of the criticisms from the public with regards to Alios is that it's just an excuse to put money up. You know, it's, it's the, the cost of services, whether it be pitches, whether it be, doesn't affect EDI so much, but uh, whether it be leisure services, it's an excuse because it's an arm's length. It's not got the full scrutiny of the council. The councils end up getting told they've got to represent the board, not the council. So therefore, it seems that uh, it's a easy way to actually for you to generate more income by putting services up uh, the cost of services. What is your opinion on that? Uh, we'll start with North Lanarkshire, please. Ms Ferry. Thank you. Um, we do have a pricing strategy, but we have a, a number of criteria for pricing. For example, in community facilities, there's possibly five different price ranges, depending on where you fit into to, to that system. So we, they're very heavily subsidised, very, very heavily subsidised pricing. Um, museums are free. We may apply small charges for activities or a small charge to go in the tram, for example, at Summerlee. But generally, the, the, the activity is free. For community arts, we have a number of pricings as well. We have an over 25s and under 25s pricing range, um, a passport to leisure range. There's a variety of pricing for everything that we do. Do you do, did you see you did football pitches as well? We do hire the that's school pitches. A, that's yeah. always a contentious issue with the public. At, at, yeah. uh, at we hire the school pitches. Our, play, our pitch price higher is exactly the same as North Lanarkshire Leisure. So there's no competition between the two. Okay. Ah, that is a very interesting scenario. There is no competition between uh, Culture NL uh, and North Lanarkshire Leisure. Is there a written agreement about that? I don't, I don't know if there's a written agreement, but we do, we do mirror each other's pricings for, for pitches. We have agreed that um, previously. They weren't the same as each other. Um, but as of the past year, um, they have actually mirrored each other. They're the same now. Are there any councillors on North Lanarkshire Leisure um, and Culture NL boards, both of them? No. Okay. Sorry, Josh. Just continue. Uh, I can only speak from, from our perspective, but um, our, as Bill described, it's stack and high, sell and cheap model was actually developed as part of when we were still within the council, and that has not changed, and the prices have not gone up apart from inflation. Um, and that, that means that, for example, somebody that's in, um, in receipt of benefits can use any of our facilities at any time, including all the courses and classes and swimming lessons for 50 pence a time. Um, and uh, an all-inclusive family membership is only £28, and that includes absolutely everything. And that's not changed, apart from inflation, since we, since we left the council. That is a different operating model to many others. We took the view early on that we were absolutely not going to compete with the private sector. The private sector can do its thing and attract people at a higher level. Uh, of course, we were aiming for the family market, the, the absolute mass participation market, and particularly focusing on those people who, are, who would find uh, family budget stretched in order to take a healthy lifestyle. That's very interesting, Mr Murray, because one of the other criticisms <coughs> tends to be of Valios is the fact that uh, they end up working in parts of the, say from the leisure point of view, they start competing with the private sector, they start, we all know in certain areas, the minute someone jumps into a swimming pool, it's massively subsidised, uh, but uh, some are actually offsetting that by moving into parts of the, the leisure industry that people wouldn't traditionally think was something that a local authority should be uh, backing, you know, from the point of view that, you know, should a local authority be having a spa? when competing with the private sector, when, you know, we've got kids that we need to actually get involved in other sporting, like, some of the minority sports and things like that. You know, uh, that's quite an interesting point you brought up there. You know, uh, I'd be interested to see you develop that further and to hear from others as well. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yep, it, it's, a, it's an operating model that was looked at by Mr McLeish's uh, working group on sport. It was, it was mentioned as, as part of that. And it's, it's, a, different, it's a different approach. Um, the Western Isles... Um, adopted the same approach to the same pricing structure about three years ago. Um, we've been running it now for 
14 years and the, the difference from before to now, if you take out inflation, is an increase in attendances at our centres of 88% and, an increase, and, and, importantly, an increase in income by 89%. It's the, it's the little model versus the Marks and Spencers model. It's getting more people through the door rather than putting prices up all the time. Um, Murray Council have recently begun, they began it this financial year again on the same model and they're already seeing significant increases. Um, the Western Isles have only been, as I said, they've been doing it three years and my understanding is that their increase in, even in some of the remoter places where they're only open on an island half a week, they're now seeing overall totals of over 30% increase in usage and over I think it's 27% on income. I'd need to check those figures. But it's a model that is, does work and, and seems to be take, being taken up elsewhere. I feel I should do the BBC announcer thing and say other supermarkets are available. Uh, <laughs> Ms Ferry, please. And being a cultural trust, um, our competition is anyone else who provides cultural activity or a, a social event. Really. I, um, I think we've already established that you're a little bit more than just a cultural trust if you're dealing with football pitches and other things too. Yeah, but the, the fo yes, the focus of the organisation is culture. The, the football pitches, the school, the, the school letting, the community letting is one aspect of what we do, yes. But we're not, we're not in competition. I wouldn't say we're in competition with hotels, for example. Um, if somebody wanted to hire a community centre or a hotel, we would be the much more, you know, less expensive option. Uh, we don't try and price ourselves in accordance with, with such things. But you could have a situation where somebody wants to hire a football pitch and their choice is either through you or North Lanarkshire Leisure mm -hmm. or through some, uh, somebody like Goals, for example, mm -hmm. which operates in various parts of Scotland. Do they not? Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. As I say, we match North Lanarkshire Leisure's prices, they equally match ours. That's, that's the only the information I have on the pitches. Okay. George? Just one final question, Convener. It's basically the, on the operational uh, board level as well. I haven't been a councillor, I've seen the challenges that you've got to balance the two. And I'm, I'm wondering, uh, have, how often have councillors actually declared an interest at a board meeting or at a council meeting, declared an interest and withdrawn from a discussion that they believe has given them a conflict of interest? Alexander. Uh, they would routinely declare their interest. Um, I'm not aware that they've ever felt on any particular discussion there was a conflict. I can't recall a member leaving a council committee because of any particular discussion with regard to High Life Island. I think members apply the, the standard test um, and decide at the time whether or not it's, it's severe enough for them to leave the room. I want, I want to get this straight. So folk have declared but have not left the room? Yeah. I mean, declaring an interest is normal, but to, to leave the room, there'd have to be a particular conflict. So when we, at any council meeting, it's, it's quite often unusual for councillors not to declare an interest because they're involved in all sorts of groups and boards and, and you know, have employee relationships with the council. Um, but for, for there to be a conflict of interest that would compromise them in any particular discussion would be a different level of that test. Okay. Um, Mr Watson and Mr Adair in terms of Edinburgh. Um, we, all councillors, all directors have to declare their interest every board meeting. Um, I'm aware that a number of councillors who were on the EDI board also sat on the council's planning committee and if our planning applications were being considered they withdrew from that planning committee and did not consider and were not party to any of the discussions on that. Okay, let's move away from the planning aspect. The economy committee is the one that you report to in the main, is it? Yes. I think you said earlier. Are there any directors of EDI on the economy committee? Yes, two. Um, have they ever declared an interest at that economy committee and left? They've declared an interest. They did not leave, if I remember correctly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, North Lanarkshire. The members of the Culture NL Board declare an interest against each relevant paper at the beginning of the Learning and Leisure Services Committee. They take no part in the discussion, but they do not leave the chambers. Okay. George, do you want to come back on that point? No. Um, I, I'm, One point for the record. Yes, Mr. Which is, Alexander. Uh, we recently have a new chair of the Education, Children and Adult Services Committee, and at that time he was a board member of High Life Highland and he chose to stand down as a board, being a board member of High Life Highland when he became the chair of the committee. 
Right, I'm going to put this on the record because I think it needs to be done. Um, previously, uh, in another life as a counsellor, um, the last lot of advice that we received was that if you declared an interest on anything, you had to leave proceedings. Now, I know that um, the advice that is given um, in some places is different from the advice given in others. Um, and I know that all of this is down to the judgment of the individual anyway. Um, but I think that we as a committee uh, need to, to get some clarification um, from uh, the Standards Commission and others uh, around about this matter. And I suggest that we write to them. Can we agree that? Thank you. Uh, Mr Wilson. Thank you, conveners. Just on that point raised by Mr Adam about members excluding, excluding themselves from discussion on the issue. But the matter that I would like to examine is if where elected members sit on a board of an ALIO where a committee is making a funding decision regarding that ALIO. In those circumstances, what do elected members tend to do? Because there's a difference between how, being party to a discussion as opposed to making a, when a, a committee, because all the organisations, possibly the exception of EDI, local authorities are making fund, funding decisions that are, apply to the alios that they may be sitting on, and do members exclude themselves when a committee is making a funding decision or full council? is making a funding decision when it applies to the ALIO that they sit on the board. Mr Alexander. It's difficult to recall specific examples, so we can recall some examples where that has happened, but we would probably have to organise some check of council minutes. I, I think that, that would be useful if you could do that, and if you could write to the committee, that would be fine. Uh, Ms McMurrach. The Planetary Council would ask for the same you want to write to yes, us? Please. Okay. Um, Jane, did I see you indicate in there? Sorry. Okay. Um, I want to um, go back to the establishment and um, terms and conditions. Um, and I want to ask some questions round about um, pension funds because we've uh, uh, recently been undertaking a, a little bit of a look at local authority pension funds. Um, are High Life members uh, members of the Highland uh, Pension Fund? We are an admit, admitted body in the, the Council's fund. Uh, yes. Do they have the same um, terms and conditions, your employees, as, as Highland Council staff? Yes. Um, is there any deficit that you have? There is. Uh, how, in the value of that? I, I would need to check the exact figure, but a uh, figure of around about £5 million. Pounds. For and our is, share of the pension fund. Yeah. And is that a manageable figure for High Life, do you think? Or is that a burden that was transferred which is difficult to cope with? Um, I, I think, with, as, as with all pension deficits, if it was called in tomorrow, it would be very difficult to deal with. But it, as these things are uh, longer term, it's, it's manageable on a year to year basis. And is that going down or up? Um, it, it fluctuates. It went down, it, it went up. Where after the first year it went down and then it was back up again last year. Okay, same question for EDI. Yeah, we are an admitted body to the Lothian Pension Fund and um, staff have an option of joining the Lothian Pension Fund or having a private arrangement. The majority of staff have taken the option to join the Pension Fund. Um, it's all staff who do join have effectively the same terms and conditions as employees of Edinburgh Council. And the deficit scenario? I think the deficit is, the uh, pension fund is running about 94% and EDI's um, share of that is about £500,000. It has increased recently as bond rates have changed and changed the overall deficit. It is manageable within EDI's resources. Thank you. Culture NL. Yes, thank you. We are an admitted body um, with Strathclyde Pension Fund and like the other organisations here, there is a deficit. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the figures with me today. I'd be happy to present them later. Uh, I would be grateful for those figures. And Bon Accord Care, please, Ms Ross. Um, we're an admitted body and yes, we do have a deficit as well. Round about, um, all our staff are on the same terms and conditions. Our deficit is around about £8 million. Uh, Is that growing or decreasing? 
it, the, this is our second year operating. It has increased in the last And is it years. manageable, do you think? We, our pension contributions have increased um, to help us manage that. Your pension contributions? Our employers' contributions have your increased. Your employers' yes. Yes. contribution um, has increased. OK. Um, can I thank you all very much uh, for your evidence uh, today? Um, we will uh, be... Uh, Considering the evidence that uh, we will get from Aberdeen City Council um, at a later date, uh, and then the committee will consider its uh, draft report. Uh, I'll now briefly suspend the meeting to allow a change over of witnesses. Thank you. Um, next, uh, agenda item two, uh, our inquiry into fixed odds betting terminals. Uh, we're now going to take evidence from Scottish Government officials as part of that uh, inquiry, um, which of course are proposals uh, in the Scotland Bill. Um, I welcome Quentin Fisher, 
Head and Walter Drummond Murray, Policy Officer from the Licensing and Human Trafficking Team. Uh, do you want to make any brief opening remarks, gentlemen? No, thank you. Can I first of all clarify that uh, you watched last week's or have read the official report from last week's committee We've meeting? We've read the official report, yes. We've read the official report, yes. Okay, in which case we will uh, move straight to, to questions. Uh, one of the uh, things that will, came up last week was um, planning, uh, and the local authorities seemed to, to feel that they, um, they couldn't use planning to the extent that they feel that they should be able to in terms of um, the sighting of bookmaker shops, which of course uh, then leads on to, in most cases, fixed on betting terminals. Do you have any comments from a government perspective on that, please, gentlemen? I think we naturally, an underlying point is that we feel that licensing is the more appropriate mechanism to deal with these things, that whether a betting shop should be allowed or not allowed should more naturally, as I say, fall into licensing. That said, obviously, we don't have the power in that regard. So, I mean, in answer to your question on planning, uh, Mr Neil did indicate to Parliament that we would look at amending the use classes order if we did not get the most effective powers on controlling payday lending and gambling from the UK Government. Uh, obviously, the Scotland Bill has now gone to the House of Lords and the Scottish Government will be considering the next steps. Uh, we are, however, clear that whether a betting shop is allowed or not is, as I say, more naturally a, planning, a licensing decision rather than a planning one. Um, one of the things which... Uh many of us around the table have found previously uh, in our previous lives as, as councillors, uh, Mr Buchanan being the only one uh, who has escaped um, uh, being a councillor, um, uh, is that you, know, you are, find yourself in situations where you, as Mr Adam described earlier, wearing one hat or, or and you're in another place and you're wearing another. Um, and often... Uh, difficulties arise between planning committees and licensing boards. Uh, would it not be much easier to have some kind of uh, joint up approach in these regards? And is that possible um, for the Scottish Government to, to consider? Well, I think it's not possible as things currently stand because there's this distinction between the reserve powers uh, in regard of licensing of betting and the devolved powers in respect of planning. But I think it's familiar territory for the local authorities, not just in the context of betting, but uh, pubs and all the other licensed activities, that there is this distinction um, where you're approaching things from sort of a very different mindset, uh, with licensing being concerned with the typical licensing objectives of protecting public health, preventing criminality, reducing disorder, etc. Planning is something sort of very different. OK, we heard also last week that there was a flaw in the Gambling Act of 2005 in terms of um, being able uh, to um, police with a small p some aspects of the Gambling Act. Um, I understand that there was an attempt to amend that during the course of the Scotland Bill, so we were told. Can I ask, has the Scottish Government made any representations to the UK Government to try and amend that to ensure that um, licensing boards have the ability to police some of these outlets better than is currently the case? I take it the, um, that you're referring to the, the, the provision or, or, or the, uh, around the licensing standards officer yep. um, and, and their ability to do that. Um, we, we have raised the issue with, with the UK government. Um, having said that, this is, this is a, not a new thing, this is, this is an old thing. Um, the Gambling Commission has also made representations. I know the Gambling Commission offered evidence to this committee um, in which they, they raised this particular point as well. Um, what we have done, of course, because we, we cannot change the legislation, needless to say, um, the UK legislation, but what we have done um, is, is we have supported the work the Gambling Commission has done. Um, the UK government's response been to the Scottish government's requests for this to be changed? Um, well, you would note that there have been no amendments to the Scotland Bill. I, I understand that, but you said, Mr Fisher, that the Scottish Government had made representations to the UK Government in this regard. Mm -hmm. What were the, were, the, were the responses from uh, the UK Government? I understand that the, um, the, uh, 
the amendment itself was rejected uh, during the Scotland Bill's passage through the House of Commons. But in terms of written responses, etc., from the UK government, what has the Scottish government actually received back? I think from memory, um, Kenny McCaskill, as Cabinet Secretary for Justice, did write to his counterpart at the time, who again from recollection, I think it might have been Jeremy Hunt, um, raising the matter, and then Mr Hunt did reply with a willingness to work to do something on this. Uh, more recently, you Officials, again, have indicated a willingness to approach the problem, but I think the point is it requires primary legislation. The Scotland Bill may not necessarily be the right vehicle to do that, but they've expressed a willingness, but there has as yet been no sign of that work I, being undertaken. I think I can speak for colleagues here and say that we would be interested in seeing um, the, the lobbying that has gone on and the responses that have come back from the UK government at that point, if we could... I think that correspondence if, has been published previously, but we certainly... If you could send that thing. to the committee, uh, Mr Drummond-Murray, I think that would be um, uh, useful um, for us indeed. Um, is there anyone else at this point? Because I seem to... No. On you go, John. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. It's just a question regarding the, what the Scottish Government's perspective is on fixed odds betting terminals uh, and whether or not they are a problem in themselves or is it the users of those machines that are the problem? I think we share the concern that's been expressed by many stakeholders that fixed odds betting terminals may be particularly problematic. This may be due to the speed of play, the stakes and the nature of the casino-type games such as roulette that are played on them. Nevertheless, as regulators, we do acknowledge that the empirical evidence is currently inconclusive, or at least there are differing views on how it should be interpreted. Against that, the anecdotal evidence of harm is substantial, and we note the position of the Gambling Commission, which has said there is a case for taking action on fixed odds betting terminals on a purely precautionary principle. Fundamentally, however, we do not have the policy responsibility or legislative powers for fixed odds betting terminals or gambling more generally. We have not therefore developed and agreed a detailed policy approach on what specific steps could or should be taken to mitigate possible harm. As I say, measures such as reducing stakes, reducing prizes, slowing the speed of play and limiting the number of machines are worth looking at. But in terms of both the current constitutional arrangements, uh, as well as those set out in the Scotland Bill, it is for the UK Government to undertake that work. Some of the evidence we heard last week in the round table discussion was that there's, there seemed to be a flaw in the Gambling Act 2005 regarding enforcement officers and the role of enforcement officers, which are different in Scotland as they are to England and Wales. And so some of the evidence we heard suggested that if the enforcement officers had the same powers in Scotland, then they would be able to deal with some of the issues that are being raised with fixed odd betting terminals. What would be your position on that? Uh, I think probably the issues around fixed odds betting terminals are more fundamental than enforcement. And the issues that are being raised in terms of staking or what have you, and in terms of the speed of play, these are not something that would actually be addressed by enforcement. I mean, having said that, better enforcement would obviously be welcome and could only be a good thing. And there may be very specific instances where a particular betting shop isn't doing, isn't following the codes of practice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but there are more fundamental, fundamental issues that re regulation wouldn't address. Has there been any discussions with the UK government regarding licensing officers' remits in Scotland to, to well, amend the 2005 Act? I think that's really the, the issue just discussed with the convener. That this con we have raised it with the UK government on a number of occasions. Ministers have raised it in correspondence. Um, but the ball is firmly in the UK government's court to actually do something about it and find the right legislative vehicle. Thank you. OK. In terms of uh, the UK government and the Scottish government's policy position, um, I'm sure that um, you will be, if not already, having done so, conveying what happened at last week's committee to the Cabinet Secretary and the relevant ministers. Um, has there been any um, uh, discussions um, with UK government um, in recent times um, about the lack of empirical evidence, as you have said, um, to see if something can be put together in cooperation uh, with both governments uh, to see exactly what harm these machines are doing? Again, this is something that we have written um, to UK ministers about um, previously, and I think we'll 
again, share that information, the, the letters with you, the correspondence with you, if that would be helpful. I think from our perspective, in terms of the survey um, that we carried out, the written submissions that we have received, um, and the evidence that we took last week, where it seems that everyone, apart from the bookmakers, including other folks from within the gambling industry, felt that there were real difficulties um, with these machines. It seems that there has been inaction on the part uh, of government to address these concerns. Is that the case? Convener, I was asked, convener, if you meant the UK government or the Scottish government or I, both. I said governments, governments, and I meant both. Um, well, obviously, from a Scottish government perspective, um, work that we have done, um, we have, for example, commissioned research um, some years ago, not into fixed odds betting terminals particularly, but gambling more broadly. Um, we are constrained by the fact that this remains a reserved matter. Um, whatever, whatever we do has to be within those, those confines. Um, and consequently, the main thrust of, of our efforts have been actually in terms of engaging with the UK government and with the Gambling Commission to try to improve the regulation that is already there. Yeah, I would possibly add to that. I mean, whilst there may be a view that not enough has been done, it's not the case that nothing has been done. The Gambling Commission did produce a new code of practice, which came into effect in April 2014, which um, took some steps that required um, people staking over £50 on these machines to go to the counter to seek authorisation or have some sort of interaction. Um, there is there going to be a triennial review which they conduct on stakes and prizes for gaming machines, and that's due in 2016. So there is ongoing work to improve the, the research picture, and there is a willingness, or rather a recognition, that there's already a case for doing something on a precautionary basis, and they're going to see what effect the measures that have already been taken have before um, considering next steps. Well, look at some of these measures, um, and if you look at the evidence, some of the evidence that we received last week, um, the registration for over £50 seems to be um, being used as a marketing tool uh, by many of the uh, betting companies. Uh, we were told that uh, folk were getting um, text messages to their mobile phones because they have to register with their mobile phone um, uh, with adverts such uh, or slogans such as big men bet big. Um, you know, none of this seems to be particularly precautionary um, to me. Um, and, you know, in terms of what has happened thus far, it seems that we have just created yet another marketing tools um, for the betting shops. What's the Scottish Government's view on that? I, mean, I think we would be deeply concerned if that practice as we're going on, and it would be something that the Gambling Commission should certainly be aware of and discussing, because it does seem to be counter to the spirit of what they're signing up for and what that specific tool is for. So what are the Scottish Government going to do in terms of ensuring that the Gambling Commission uh, and the UK Government take cognizance of these very real concerns? Mm -hmm. We have an ongoing relationship with the Gambling Commission and speak to them on numerous, well, numerous occasions over the course of the year, but in answer directly to your question, we have no power to ensure that they do anything, really. Convener, it may be worth just flagging, um, I'm, I'm sure the committee is aware, but the, the Scottish Government's position in respect of the regulation of ga gambling more broadly and not just on, on FOBTs um, is, of course, that we believe that that power should be devolved um, to Scotland and that would give us the ability um, to actually look at these issues do the necessary research, do the necessary development work, um, and then make the regulation as effective as possible. Uh, so, uh, in, in terms of the Law Society of Scotland's concern about the constitutional position, whereby licensed premises are uh, in Scotland currently are regulated by both the UK and the Scottish governments, the Scottish government's position is that all of these uh, regulations, all of the legislation, all of that should be devolved so that the Scottish Government can deal with it in entirety. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Convener. Just to uh, extend that slightly, we've talked about the Gaming Commission and we've talked about the UK Government, negotiations with UK Government. 
Could you indicate what discussions have taken place with licensing boards in Scotland about the use of their powers to restrict uh, the number of premises, but particularly the number of fixed odds betting terminals that are located within uh, betting shop premises? Because the, my understanding is at the present moment there is some, some powers there to allow licensing boards to restrict the numbers, uh, but has there been any discussion with the Scottish Government to use those powers to try and get licensing boards to cut back? Because we heard one uh, contribution last week that effectively said that the, the chain of uh, betting shops that they operated, uh, they were maxed out in the number of fixed odds betting terminals in each of the shops. So there didn't seem to be any restrictions on the number of uh, terminals that were being placed in betting shops. Could it not be something the Scottish Government does with licensing boards to say, look, you have the power to restrict numbers, uh, why don't you use those powers? Who's going to take that one? Mr Drummond Murray. Um, as a general point, there has been engagement with licensing boards done under the auspices of the Gambling Commission. Um, it's most predominantly been focused on enforcement and the points about what powers they have and they don't have. Um, I'm not aware it's specifically got into the issue about what powers they might have in relation to limiting numbers of fixed odds betting terminals. But I think there's a general assumption under the legislation that there is a maximum of four per shop, and that tends to be what they get. Um, I'm not aware of any suggestion that licensing boards have significant powers in that regard to either say no to an application for a betting shop in the first place, or once they've granted it, to significantly limit the number to a, something less than four. So basically what you're saying, Mr Drummond Murray, is that there's a free-for-all out there and licensing boards basically have no powers whatsoever in these regards? Um, I'm saying... That's what you've just described to me, I would say. Um, I, I don't think I misheard that. I wouldn't characterise it as strongly as that. I think there is a regret that licensing boards do not have more powers, particularly prior to 2005 and the passing of the Gambling Act 2005. There was a demand test which would have enabled... Uh, application to be dealt with on the basis of we've got one betting shop in this high street already, we don't need another, and it would be the onus on the applicant to prove that there was unsatisfied demand. That test was removed under the 2005 Act and we very much regret its passing. And what licensing boards, local authorities are telling us is they do not feel they have enough power about determining applications. So I'm not going to say it's as far as a free-for-all, I think they do have powers. Okay, describe, describe to us the powers that a licensing board would have in terms of restricting the amount of betting shops and FOBTs in their area? Very little in that regard. I, mean, I was referring to the powers they do have in terms of monitoring behaviour, ensuring that underages are kept out, ensuring that the codes of practice have been complied with. In but, terms but, but basically it's... what you're saying to me is that licensing boards would have basically no way of stopping the issuing of licences to as many booties as could possibly fall in, in, into that area and would have no um, ability to restrict the amount of FOBTs other than shoot at the, the, max, uh, the max of four. Is that what you're saying to me? It's correct that the maximum number of FOBTs in each betting premises is set in UK legislation. Yes, at four. And that, that's not, but, you know, there to my could understanding, be... that's not my discretion. That's not a licensing board discretion. Uh, but in terms of the amount of bookies, you, they would have to license whatever number. It's basically what Mr was, Drummond Murray has said. There was no mechanism for really dealing with over-provision under the Gambling Act 2005. OK. So there is no ability whatsoever for a, a licensing board... Um, to use um, the over-provision powers that they have in terms of alcohol, for example, in dealing with bookmaker shops. Exactly. So the only way that um, in a local authority area um, they would be able to stop um, uh, an increase in the amount of bookmaker shops would be through the planning system. Is that correct? I think the view of planning that it's, as we said at the start, is not the right mechanism for dealing with planning well, more can, naturally. Can I stop you there, Mr Drummond Murray, because you've already said that planning is not the right mechanism, mm -hmm. but there seems to be no other mechanism in terms of licensing. So if I was sitting in a local authority at this moment in time, 
what I would be trying to do if I had concerns about the amount of bookmakers in my area, um, as Councillor Rooney indicated last week, where in a small parade of shops in uh, his ward, there are three bookmakers with 12 FOBTs, um, and I've since found out uh, since then that there's also a pawn shop there which is being used, uh, and then folk are going into these booties. Uh, he feels that that's over-provision. It seems his community feels that there's over-provision there. It seems that there is cross-party agreement uh, in Glasgow City that there is over-provision. Um, now, to him, the only way that he can deal with it, and you have basically just said the same to me today, is through planning legislation. So what can be done in these well, regards? I think the point I was trying to make is we're just not sure how effective planning would be, but nonetheless, Mr Neil did say that um, we would look at the use classes order following the conclusion of the Scotland Bill, uh, and that may provide a route for something to be done through planning, but uh, say there are questions about how effective that would be. Right. Let's hit the specifics here. Has the Scottish Government considered revising those planning rules to create a separate planning class for licensed betting premises, thereby ensuring that planning permission must be sought from a licensing board to open a licensed betting premises. Is there scope to include this in the current independent review that is taking place? I have to say that I'm not the planning expert. I'm aware there was a consultation done in 2014 on the very question of expanding use classes order. The conclusion of that was not to go forward with, with what you're describing in terms of betting shops and putting them in a separate use classes order. However, Mr Neil has subsequently said that we're happy to look at it again following the Scotland Bill. There is a, a strong preference for us to have the powers through licensing to deal with these issues, but if that doesn't happen, then yes, planning may provide us some route to do something and we're happy to look at it. I have to say that, you know, I would like to see these powers come here too. Um, but as it stands at this moment, uh, unless similar amendments are lodged and passed in the House of Lords, it's unlikely that that is going to happen. So we have got some difficulties that we need to deal with um, using um, the legislative competences that we currently have. And I would hope, um, and I think I could speak for everyone here, that during the course of the review of planning, and I realise that you're not a planning expert, that these would, things would be looked at. Uh, Mr Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Just to follow up on my earlier question, the, the issue for us today is to look at what we can do to try and restrict or control uh, the number of FOBTs. As part of the paperwork we received for this meeting, we received a note uh, in terms of the, to allow us to consider the questions we were asking. And in that note, and I'll quote it exactly because I want a response to your views on what we received as a committee and as committee members. The Gambling Act 2005 gives licensing boards the powers to, amongst others, review premises licenses and attach conditions or revoke them. In doing so, it should be mindful, amongst others, the, lic the licensing objectives relating to preventing crime, fairness, protecting children and vulnerable people and the licensing authority statement of licensing policy. The licensing policy can reflect local issues, priorities and risks and underpin its approach to local regulation. Do you know of any licensing boards that have been encouraged to set up licensing objectives which outline the concerns that are not only being raised by this committee but raised by others in re relation to the unfettered market for betting shops and FOBTs in Scotland at the present moment. Who's going to take that? Mr um, Drummond Murray. As I mentioned earlier, the Gambling Commission did do a particular session with licensing boards on the very question of their policy statements and what could be in. Um, so yes, they are encouraged to take account of the licensing objectives and formulating their policy. The more fundamental question as to how far you can use those policies to tackle the problem specifically on fixed odds betting terminals I am aware of a case in England, I think it was Newham Council, did try to prevent a betting shop being opened on public health grounds, and I think they lost it on appeal. It's my recollection of how that ended up. So yes, I'm going to come back to the point that boards do feel very circumscribed in terms of the legislation about what action they can actually take. Okay, my question yeah. was about the Scottish Government and 
discussions with licensing boards, not the gambling board, uh, because I want to be clear about the guidance and the advice and the information that's being provided by the Scottish Government in relation to the operation of licensing boards and whether or not policy decisions. Now, you mentioned a local authority south of the border that tried to uh, invoke certain conditions that these decisions were overturned. The court system in Scotland is different uh, and is whether or not the Scottish Government would be seen to be actively supporting licensing boards such as Glasgow, where we heard last week there was serious concerns about the number of licensed betting shops and the number of FOBTs that were in uh, operation in Glasgow at the present moment. Has the Scottish Government encouraged or the, in, entered into discussion or debate with licensing boards about using those powers to actually restrict the number of betting shops and FOBTs in their own local authority area? He's going to take that one. I'll take it in the first instance. Um, we, um, from officials from justice, have not engaged with local authorities to have that discussion, um, to my knowledge. Um, whether or not planning officials have, I'm afraid I, I cannot say, I don't know. Um, but um, we haven't engaged with them, I think, right. primarily for, for, for reason that we actually have no particular locus in this matter. Yeah, I can only add to that that, yeah. No, can, sorry, convener. Mr. Wilson. I just want to say the Scottish Government has no particular locus on the matter of the number of betting shops, the number of FOBTs that are in, currently in operation in Scotland. The Scottish Government has no locus on that. Mr. That's Fisher. One word I should have said was power, is what I meant. Um, we have no particular powers um, in respect of actually addressing that issue. Mr. Drummond Murray, you wanted to come in. Well, I was only going to add that we did attend the, the uh, discussions that the Gambling Commission did organise, so we do so see ourselves as involved in this process. But as we come back to the constitutional position, which is that DCMS are the people responsible for this, they charge the Gambling Commission to take forward this work, and the Gambling Commission have undertaken that process of engagement with the licensing boards in trying to develop their policy statements to be, to be the most effective that they can be. Uh, Jane Baxter, please. Thanks, Convener. It's, it's, it's now two questions. Um, I'm just wondering, Mr Drummond Murray, when did all this discussion between the Gambling Board and local authorities take place? This year, April this year. perhaps. But... Okay, thank you. And then my, my next question is for you, Convener, and members of the committee, because I think this planning review is an opportunity for us to put some sort of marker down. I, I completely agree with you that we should try and do what we can do. Um, and I'm wondering if this committee could write to the independent review body and just, just raise this issue or make the point or reflect the discussions we've had? I, I think that that's uh, a likely scenario and we will discuss that in some more depth, but uh, I think that that's the, the way we're going if I'm reading everybody around the room uh, mm -hmm. properly. I don't want to... Uh, Thank you. ...preempt anything, but I think that's where we're at. Uh, Mr Coffey, please. Very much, Convener. I mean, the, the discussion, it sounds like a, a discussion about a, a transfer of power that doesn't actually confer any powers. <laughs> it's a very strange discussion to have, but I, I'm going to take a chance and ask another, another related question. Um, the, the committee last week I was asking about the deployment of technology, particularly with the point of view of protecting individuals who might be tempted to, to, to gamble beyond their means and how technology could be better deployed to, to stop that. Uh, there was some discussion about it, you'll recall, Convener, uh, and I think William Hill's organisation had, had put in place some kind of system to try to identify people at risk. Do we, is there any way we can, we can progress this matter further? Because it seemed to me that the, the deployment of the technology was about enriching and, 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 and hooking a person to the, to the experience of gambling rather than protecting them from it if they were vulnerable. Is there any scope for us to influence that kind of direction of travel to try and protect individuals from making those kinds of mistakes? Who's going to take that? <coughs> yeah, I'll take it. Um, yeah, I mean, I noted the discussion in committee last week and uh, the discussion on the value of the algorithms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because these machines are in, basically run from servers in the companies, it's actually very easy to make a change to the machine, which they've already done, for example, so that a um, pop-up message comes up after you've spent £20 or £50, whatever it might be, saying, should you be taking a break or what have you. 
our more fundamental concern is that all of these things are aimed at the gambler rather than the product itself. So we don't think technology would be the whole answer in that regard. It needs to be wider than just trying to provide little uh, uh, discrete measures that may assist an individual gambler. And that brings you back to the discussion about the stakes and the, the speed of play, et cetera, et cetera, more generally, rather than just trying to tailor something for an individual. Mm. But I mean, we, we must have an interest, though, in whether harm is being caused. And I think you, you mentioned that in your remarks. So there's, there's an extensive amount of data gathering will take place here and the whole gambling experience that, that, that a person has. And the industry will have all that data. Do we have any opportunity or right of access to that data to see if we can, if we can help and to protect people? I, I very much doubt it, convener, but surely there has to be an opportunity there to ask the industry if they would share that data. Mr. Um, I think there is actually a willingness to share data which they do to the, the, the research bodies such as the Responsible Gambling Strategy Board and the, Res the Responsible Gambling Trust under them who have undertaken substantial um, uh, research studies into this issue, um, albeit that the conclusions um, uh, are subject to different interpretation. Um, I can say we haven't specifically asked for this data. I'm not quite sure what we would do with it, but certainly the experts in the field who are conducting these sorts of studies could make use of it, certainly. Okay. Thank you. How much contact has the Scottish Government had with um, betting organisations and anti-gambling organisations um, since the start or since we indicated that we were going to have this inquiry? Well, if I can go back a little further, I mean, over the last two or three years, since the whole question of constitutional arrangements changing, um, we've moved from a position of virtually zero engagement from different companies to quite substantial engagement. The Association of British Bookmakers have been in touch with us. William Hill have been in touch with us on a couple of occasions. And also we have uh, met with, from memory, Money Advice Scotland and the RCA Trust, who work in the support sector, providing support for problem gamblers. Senate? Um, only via William Hill, who are a member of Senate, but not Senate itself. So, William Hill, not Senate, but William Hill on behalf of Senate? Um, no, I mean, they didn't portray themselves as speaking on behalf of Senate. They portrayed but, themselves as being a member of Senate and told us about it. But <clears throat> not, not any, any um, lobbying from Senate itself or meetings, discussions with you in terms of Senate itself, no? No, albeit this is quite a new organisation, as I understand it. So. Okay. Um, in terms of discussions with officials uh, in other parts of government, how regularly have you met with um, planning officials regarding these matters? Yeah, we, have an ongoing, have you had? we have an ongoing regular contact by email when I spoke to planning officials yesterday. And what was that discussion about? Could you give us an indication? Uh, it was about the point about the use classes order and um, what exactly I mean, the commitment may be to, to look at that following the Scotland Bill. And what were the responses from those planning officials in that regard? Well, it's really the remarks that I made earlier in terms of Mr Neil's commitment to look at it, look at amending the use classes order following the Scotland Bill. So... Um, do your own team um, or the, the, the responsible minister's cabinet secretary intend to submit anything to the independent review of planning on this issue? I'm afraid I couldn't say. Has there been any discussion about that at all? I um, would assume there has been some discussion, but not that I've been involved in. Okay. Um, can I thank you uh, for appearing uh, this morning as part of our consideration? Um, uh, as the committee uh, agreed, um, uh, we'll uh, now move into private session um, and I'll suspend the meeting to allow for the clearance of the room. Thank you.